So um, anybody checking to see if the uh, wax is dry on the floors? <laughs> you can start moving back in. I know that was <laughs> always what I was waiting on. Um, it's good to see y'all this morning. Welcome. As you come in, make sure you mute yourself. Just we keep having some feedback, but thank y'all for being here today. We'll get started in just a minute. It's take me to work. What I've got to do right now. Welcome, welcome. Glad y'all are here. Happy Tuesday. We'll get started right at 10 to honor your time and make sure we get through everything today. We have a jam packed session. Glad to have y'all with us. All right. Well, it is 10, so let's get started. Good morning and welcome to the Foundations of Literacy Instructional Practice webinar for Standard 3 on Phonics. Um, the Office of Early Learning and Literacy and the Office of Assessment Standards is excited to come together to provide this um, training for you today that really focuses in on the Foundations of Literacy and particularly this week we're going to focus on Standard 3. As we get started, I'd love to introduce us to you. My name is Mandy Hawker, and I work for the Office of Assessment and Standards. Um, I'm on the Standards ELA team, and I support elementary ELA standards. With me today from my office, I also have Brenna McCormick, who is our co-pilot. She'll be in the chat, letting you in and out of the um, meeting today muting you if we need to uh, just so there's no feedback and answering any questions you might have in the chat. Um, also, I have Kim and Audrey Camp with me from E-L-E-O-E-L-L. -E -L -L. I'll let them introduce themselves. Kim? Good morning. I am Kim Camp. I am in the Office of um, Early Learning and Literacy and I am happy to be with you guys today. Actually, today Audrey and I are coming to you from Greenville County. Um, we are out of training ourselves and we slipped away a little bit to be with you guys. Good morning, everyone. I am Audrey Goninen and I am Kim Camp's colleague and I um, support Support, um, schools and in the Lancaster and uh, Chester school districts. So I'm so excited for you to be here today. Thank you. Now, if you will introduce yourselves in the chat, let us know your name, the role that you serve in, um, and then what district or school that you support. Go ahead and drop that into the chat. I see a great representation of all over our state. I appreciate that this morning. Um, we have found that our webinars are the best way for us to uh, share information and, and be able to reach a wide audience here um, in South Carolina. So we love that you're representing all over the state this morning. I appreciate you taking your time and joining us. It's very important to us that we are able to um, support all the way from Oconee, all the way down to Ori, to Beaufort, to Jasper, all in the middle with Colleton and Calhoun, um, and up in York and Rock Hill, Chester. We're just happy to see you all here this morning. So thank you for joining us. All right, now we'll get started with a little bit of housekeeping. So um, throughout our presentation today, we will drop several links um, in the chat. But any of our links from our session one, two, or three today can be found on our landing page. The landing page houses all the links you'll need for this presentation, as well as the recordings of our past two webinars and um, any resources that we use throughout those. So Brenna will drop the link to the landing page in the chat. She's also going to drop the link to our attendance form. Now, it's important for you to complete that attendance form just so we know who is represented here in our training today. That gives us um, some access to federal, federal accountability measures so that we know that we're supporting um, as many people across the state as possible. But that's also connected to your recertification credit that we'll talk about on our next slide. Additionally, throughout our presentation today, you'll see two icons repeated um, on several slides. Those icons are our chat icon, 
Now that represents places where we would love for you to engage with us in the chat. Maybe um, drop an answer to a question or drop your thinking um, about what's being discussed. And then you'll also see a white pencil icon. That icon is for your note catcher. So that means that there's a corresponding box on your note catcher for you to capture your thinking. All right, so the links to the landing page and attendance should be in the chat. Um, make sure to access those. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns about those, definitely reach out to Brenna in the chat. She can help you with that. All right. Now, talking about the attendance form, another place that I want to point your attention this morning is to our recertification credits. Um, throughout uh, our summer web and our series, we've been able to uh, issue recertification credit and we offer one hour of recertification credit for every hour of attendance in our webinar and to get that recertification credit there are just three expectations the first is your live attendance and participation in our session here and you're doing that um, the next is to remain in attendance for the entire duration of our webinar and then finally, the last one is to complete the attendance form that was just dropped into the chat and linked on your landing page, as well as the feedback form at the conclusion of our webinar today. All three of these areas are considered when issuing recertification credit, um, and we're just excited to be able to offer that because um, you're investing your time this summer being with us, and we want to uh, return on that investment a little bit. So we appreciate you being here. All right, our purpose for today, our purpose is to support teachers in instructing that Foundations of Literacy strand in our 2024 ELA standards with instructional efficacy. Now, if you've been with us the past two sessions, you've heard me talk about instructional efficacy. That means that the same level and rigor of instruction takes place in every district, in every classroom across the state of South Carolina, because every student in South Carolina deserves um, the same level of instruction, the same level of education, particularly with these foundations of literacy um, standards and indicators. So, Considering that purpose, I want you to think about your purpose for being here today. We'll, uh, we'll have you capture that those thoughts in just a second. Take a look at our agenda for today. We're going to do a little welcome and review, and then we're going to dig in deeply to that phonics standard and the indicators 3.1 through 3.6. We will not cover all of our phonics standards today. Uh, 3.7 and 3.8 will be covered in session four, but we will cover 3.1 to 3.6 today. So uh, a, a lot of ground to cover. And then at the end today, we'll do a little bit of feedback and then we'll listen and linger for any questions. So thinking about our purpose, I want you to consider these professional learning goals. I'll give you just a minute to read those. Our purpose is instructional efficacy in the foundations of literacy indicators. Our professional learning goals are listed on this slide. But what are you hoping to accomplish in this training today? What are some insights that you hope to obtain and share with your school or district or even just in your classroom in the students that you serve? I'd love for you to drop that into the chat. And Brenna, as those answers start coming in, I want you to share um, at least three of them with me. <clears throat> so Amber says to develop instructional strategies and resources. Again, a lot of um, developing those instructional strategies. Um, implementing the Foundations of Literacy Standards, becoming more familiar with those standards across the grades, strategies and resources. This standard band is a huge chunk. I want to gain a deeper understanding. 
support core instruction in first and second grade classrooms, which I might not be a K2 specialist, but I know we've talked a lot about that tier one core instruction being so important. Um, yeah. I love that you all as an audience recognize that the Foundations of Literacy Strand is very uh, a, a huge shift and it has a lot of impact um, for our students in South Carolina. It's one of the, the greatest shifts in the entirety of the 2024 ELA standards. However, you also notice that the phonics standard and indicators themselves are a huge impact for the students of South Carolina. Um, there's a lot more uh, systematic, explicit expectations in those indicators. So the fact that you're here today, you're getting the head of the game, you're gonna be ready to roll on that first day of school. So we appreciate you being here. And some of you start on uh, July 22nd, so we gotta hit the ground running, right? All right, thank you for engaging in the chat. Now, just like every time I want us to I want to point us to these shifting the balance professional commitments. Birkins and Yates um, outline these in the book, Shifting the Balance, and we find that they're important for us to engage with, especially in this Foundations of Literacy uh, presentation series. So consider these commitments. Choose one today that you want to uh, really keep in mind and uh, honor as we go through our presentation today. Feel free to drop into the chat which of the commitments you want to commit to most um, in our time together today. For me, I'm going to really commit to that last professional commitment, taking action rather than giving in to paralysis. Um, when I look at some of these phonics standards, it can cause paralysis. Mm. This is a lot of content for me to know as the expert in the classroom, but then also to have instructional practices that back those up. Um, it can be paralyzing for some of us, especially those of us who were never taught phonics instruction. And, and, and I don't remember being trained in that in my teacher preparation program. So uh, for me, that's going to be my commitment today. I hope you all uh, can look at these and take your commitment um, and take it to heart. And with that said, we're going to dig right into the content and I'm going to pass it off to Kim. Very good. Just, this is a reminder slide just to remind you that our recordings for session one, which was on phonemic awareness and session two, which was phonemic awareness and print concepts are on that landing page. And we re encourage you to watch and rewatch those, but not just for yourself. You want to share those with a colleague either in your school or um, throughout your district urge your um, administrator to share these um, recordings even in grade level sessions so that you guys can internalize this. On um, in session one and two, we also went deep into two reading theory models, the simple view of reading and Scarborough's reading group. We also talked a lot about the brain. We are not going to review those. If we were in person, we would actually pull out chart paper and have you write down as much as you could in your group um, about these models. But today we've just given you a space on your note catcher. But if you're doing these in your school, actually do an activity like that. Um, as a coach and a teacher, you might also want to um, make these um, models in your classroom or in your PD room so that you can think about that because if as you're talking you might say with a simple view of reading if a teacher comes to you with a problem um, and says this student can't read then you can say which part is it in this equation that is that you feel is causing um, that reader not to be able to um, read the words on the um, page or to comprehend what has been read with Scarborough's rope, remember majority of that top part, except for the print concepts, lives in our standards and the application of reading. But the foundational pieces is found in that bottom part of the rope. And if you're like me, I've had to study and really think about um, these phonics standards because it's, it was not something that was very familiar with me. And so, but I knew and know that students, they don't know how to attack words. And so this was a missing piece for them. Even though these K2 um, 
is where we think that this lives. We also know that students in third, fourth, fifth are, are um, struggling being able to lift words off the page. And so we might need to make sure that those teachers, upper grade teachers, understand um, how they can help the students with those, um, the bottom part of that rope. And then finally, that reading brain, if you can just remember that part about the phone and think about anything that I do and when I introduce words um, to students, they need to hear the sound of that word and sounds of the letters, but also that front part, um, this of course is the optical lobe back here where I um, see the words and take it in, and that frontal lobe does the sound. And so that will help you um, to remember to do both phonemic awareness and phonics with those new words. So um, just our, our foundational standards are so grounded in these models that we really want you to understand those and not just see them on the page and says, oh, there's that rope again. <laughs> All right, prior to this session, um, you were asked to read your grade level entrance statement and think about the big ideas that you found in your grade level statement and then add them to our Padlet. And so we're going to put the Padlet link in the chat again. And also there's a QR code if you want to access it um, that way. If you didn't have a chance to do that, no biggie. You can always go into the Padlet and see what everyone, see what everyone else um responses were but now we're going to um take a look at some key findings that we have um found over the past um year so over the past year we have um, been able to do these sessions in person with coaches with district level um representatives some admin and also some teachers that were able to to attend and across our whole year of doing this in uh, across the state, we noticed that there were some uh, similarities in the responses. So in the uh, purple box, you can see some of those big ideas that were pulled out. First, we see an emphasis on explicit and systematic instruction. Uh, there's also a lot around how students need guidance and support all throughout and we're moving towards mastery by the end and um, there is a note on here that says page 17 so if you've attended one of our uh, previous sessions you've read that um, page 17 and how it describes the foundations of literacy standards but that guidance and support is specifically around the statement that says if students do not have the ability to um, be proficient with grade level standards, then we have to go back and look at what is occurring previously and in previous grades to then remediate as necessary. Um, also, many participants talked about how um, there's an emphasis on the gradual release model and how that occurs in a whole group setting, small group settings, and one-to-one. -one. Again, looking for mastery by the end of the school year, these indicators and standards are not written so that uh, they are to be mastered at a certain time within the year, but really thinking about how are we um, supporting instruction in this across the year so that they have independence by the end of the year? Again, big focus on decoding and encoding, as well as comprehension, as well as looking at the different types of text. And if you're in K through five, then you'll know that there were no specific text types that were listed. And that's because the writers of the standards wanted to ensure that students in these grade levels, K through five, are exposed to just a wide variety of text. Once it shifts into sixth grade and up, there are references to specific um, types of text, but we know in the grades K through five, we just want them exposed to all kinds of text. 
We also see a lot focused on written uh, communication and the different modes of writing, narrative, informational, and argumentative. And then that huge focus on oral communication. And language is truly uh, the foundation for all literacy. And so ensuring that students have the language and can communicate clearly, but also um, receive information that way as well. Now, in the yellow box, we have just some, some tips. Um, we encourage you, if you're here as a school leader, as a district level, or even a grade level um, team leader, that you encourage your whole faculty to read these grade uh, level statements and um, discuss them. It needs to be a school-wide conversation. One way you could do that is have each grade level read their entry statement and create a chart and then hang them up across uh, the uh, walls and do a gallery walk so you can see from grade to grade to grade how are things changing. Another way was you could gr um, have groups of teachers from K through five all working together, um, talking about their own and sharing the information. Um, we encourage you to share these pages with parents so that they are getting information about, hey, what are the expectations in this grade level? And then find Finally, be noticing the quotes at the top. They're great to add into newsletters, um, into um, just communication that you share. And we actually had a reading coach that is uh, uh, works at a um, school of, within a technology realm, and she was masterful in creating bookmarks and posters of each of these quotes. They are included in the resources on the landing page. If you go to the very bottom page, there is a um, section that says fall and spring um, sessions that will have links to all of those resources as well. So they are there for you as you need. Okay, so today we're going to um, introduce you to another theoretical model, and this one is known as Aries Phases of Word Reading Development. And if you notice that word reading, that is the same words that show up in that simple view of reading and also in that bottom half of the rope. So really, that, that's where we're looking at with that. It was first created in 1996 by Lene um, Airy. She revised it 20 years ago in tw um, 2004. She had a colleague, and then she even confirmed it 10 years ago in 2014. So it has been around, and is that progression that readers take. And if you read across the top, you'll see those four phases. Pre-alphabetic, partial alphabetic, full alphabetic, and then consolidated. And each stage illustrates how word reading develops for the typical child. <coughs> Excuse me. So you will notice um, down at the bottom, you will see our um, F1.1 um, F. which that one all the way across is our phonemic awareness standard. And Mandy has clicked and you see those red circles that have come up across through there. And if you read those, then that's the order really of where our um, phonemic awareness standards are coming in. Then in that F.2, you see that is under the pre-alphabetic stage. And by reading that, you see that that basically is our concepts of print um, and our, it also says incidental visual cues. An incidental visual cue would be like if a child sees that big golden arch M in the sky that they know that that is McDonald's or they see the red octagon, they know that that's a stop sign. So those um, are um, characteristics of coming under the pre-alphabetic stage. Remember, our kindergartners are coming in with different experiences, and so the, they are going to um, vary greatly depending on their experiences with books and where they're coming in. 
So um, with our knowledge of standard one, which is um, phonological and phonemic awareness and our standard two print concepts and moving into standard three, which is phonics and word analysis skill, I want you to take a look at this class scenario. This is a kindergarten classroom. During dictation, students are to write what you see in blue. I see a big tree. But as the teacher takes up on those and she starts assessing, she sees a pattern. Several students have written what you see in orange. What instruction do you feel like should follow? Add those thoughts to the chat. Okay. We're starting to see some responses in the chat. Good. Um, segmenting CVC, focusing on that middle sound, orthographically mapping the sight word C, spacing, sight words, heart words, medial sounds. Very, very good. Those are things that we saw too. This is full disclosure. I was a first grade teacher for uh, about 10 years. I saw that all the time. I saw where students would write just that C, letter C, versus the word C that I knew I had taught back and forth. But I just marked that up as, well, that's a typical first grader, um, they'll catch on. I was a reading coach for about 10 years, a principal for about 10 years, and then went back into a first and second grade classroom. And lo and behold, I saw these um, same issues um, 30 years later. Um, I now know from studying phonemic awareness and these phonics that there were a lot of things that I could have done differently. So with print concepts, I needed to be aware that um, the word C and the letter C was being a confusion, and I might need to verbalize that and model it during a shared reading and let them students know, thinking they don't know the difference between the word and the letter, and point that out during shared reading. I didn't um, understand that our print concept indicator of knowing the difference between a letter and a word, and then using that space um helping them to see that maybe whole group maybe small group helping students and talking to them about the difference between the letter i capital letter i and the word i or even the letter l could been confusing phonemic awareness i needed to remember the that first part of phonemic awareness that says count the words in a sentence. I should have said, I see a big tree. You repeat after me, I see a big tree. How many words are in that sentence? Let's draw the blank for the words, helping them to re, um, make that connection that I needed to see the um, that they should write the word C instead of um, the letter C. Um, <clears throat> Also knowing that there is a uh, curriculum that is showing a scope and sequence and that there is a strong understanding of sounds and where I might need to go next with those sounds. And most likely in kindergarten, you're exactly right. It would be those CVC words that were there. Phonics wise instruction that we're gonna talk about today, I need to make sure that I am connecting that phonemic awareness um, so closely to the phonics. So that if I say, I see a big tree, we might even stop on big, big. How many sounds are in big, big? Let's write those down on our paper. 
And so helping them see that I can do that with magnet letters, letter tiles, those sound boxes, dictation of words and sentences. There is so much um, instruction that can come from a simple dictation of that sentence. And remember, um, we talked a little bit and we will talk more in depth about that phonics lesson um, lesson plan. And this is a great um, start with that as well. So then going back to the Aries phases, let's take a look and see where our ELA um, F.3 falls. Under the partial alphabetic, we see um, letter names and some letter sounds. This is typically 4K, 5K. Under the full alphabetic, um, that's typically um, 5K in first grade, it's initial set of phoneme graphing correspondence. And then under the consolidated, which it is typically for a first and second grader, it's that orthographic mapping that phoning graphing link, and then a lot of um, phonemes with word families, syllable patterns, um, picking up those morphemes. Now here we take our big dive into the overarching standard, ELA F.3. If you'll take just a second to read over that standard, A lot of um, folks just say, oh, um, standard three is phonics. But after you read, I feel I want you to realize that it's more than just phonics. It's more than just sounding out because that's what we've always um, been told that phonics is. When we unpack it, we see the verbs are they know it and they apply it. And they're, what are they going to know and apply? Phonics, but also word analysis skills. And that is um, very important and better, very critical. And then decoding and encoding is in the context of that. So what does all that mean? Well, phonics is decoding. It might be blending sounds together to read a word or to decode, like you see on the screen here, is that a reader translates printed words into sounds. To decode, a reader has to, if we look at that little part on mat, a reader has um, to look at all those letters, pull those letters apart, associate the accurate sounds with each of the letters, and then combine them to make the word. So if I see the word mat, I might most likely, and I'm going to help my students do this, mat. Let's put it together. What's that word? The word is mat. Encoding, on the other hand, is segmenting those sounds for spelling. To um, encode, we use those individual sounds to build and write words. So with encoding, a writer will hear, hear me say a word, or they're thinking about a word that they want to write on their paper. But if I, as the teacher, call out the word mat, or they want to write a sentence in their journal that says, wipe your feet on the mat, most kids will always um, say, how do you spell? How do you spell? Well, we want to make that link with them so that they're pulling those sounds apart. They're thinking about the sequence of those letters, how to form those letters. And they say in their own head, after I've modeled several times, M-A-T. I can write that word M-A-T. We want it to be that automatic for those students or for all of our students. So then word analysis, if you'll take a minute and read that definition of word analysis. So word analysis is actually word study. 
we are breaking down words into their smallest units of meaning. It's the ability to analyze words, and this is very critical for foundational skills. It is essential for vocabulary de um, development. Teachers model how to analyze new words, but, and we break it down by subparts. If we were in kindergarten and the word is cat, we can say we could write cat, C-A-T, but if we have more than one cat, we add that S, cats. That is analyzing on um, that word in kindergarten. Of course, in upper grades, we're going to do that even more so with prefixes and suffixes. And where okay. our standards lead us is in morphology with that. All right, so let's think about what Kim shared about what is decoding, what is encoding to answer this question. When we read, how do we process text? Go ahead and put in the chat or even think to your, just don't even worry about putting in the chat, just think to yourself, how do we process text? Is it letter by letter, word by word, or a sampling of words? And let's see, if you selected A, that we process text letter by letter, you are correct. And we know this because of eye, research, eye movement research. Uh, readers are going to see and perceive just a limited amount of input at one time. They're looking at letters, the punctuation, the spaces, all between in within a word. Um, and even really proficient readers uh, don't process whole lines of text, but they're processing it letter by letter. And then it seems as if we're reading it um, as a whole because it has been mapped into our brains. So these findings from this eye research movement um, research really shows that we have to continue to focus on sound symbols connections for students um, so that um, they can make be looking at each uh, letter and looking at the whole word. This is why, again, explicit systematic decoding and encoding is essential for proficiency in, in reading. And so during the early years of learning pre-K and K, students are learning about the alphabet. They're also learning phonemic awareness. We have seen that in standard one. And so having those two skills with the understanding that the sounds that we speak are represented by the letters is what's called the alphabetic principle. And then that leads to the ability to apply our phonic knowledge to then read and write. Transitioning from early literacy then to um, reading and writing effectively. So if we go back to Scarborough's rope, we can then say, okay, well, where is standard three within our rope? And we can see it here right in the lower portion, portion, which is word recognition. Again, this is revealing another uh, reason why it's essential in an effective literacy um, program, and that's why it is embedded in our standards, because we know that if any strand of the rope is weak, then the entire strand or the entire rope is going to be weak, which then is going to impact comprehension. Okay, so at this point, you need to go ahead and um, get your um, deconstruction of your standards, that document that um, you've been working with, where we're going to actually analyze each of these indicators and see what, what does um, standard three phonics actually look like and mean for us. So go ahead, and at the very top, you all um, notice that the standard, standard three, is in the um, dark lavender, and then each of the indicators for K, 1, and 2 are in the lighter lavender underneath. With um, 3.1, we only see that in kindergarten. We don't see that in um, second and um, first and second, but we also know that if students aren't able to do um, this 
um, indicator when they get to first grade or second grade, then we might, we will need to go back and work with them either one on one or small group. So I said all that to give you a little time to find your document and for us to get started. So go ahead and read over indicator um, 3.11. When we look at the verbs, we see three verbs in this. Identify, name, and form. When we look at the noun, what we're um, doing is upper and lowercase letters. And the context is with automaticity. Now, remember when we started unpacking standards that we said sometimes there are some um, implied messages. Well, with this one, the implication is that we will do it orally and in writing. I could hold up a letter card and say, what is this? And you would tell me it is the letter G. That was orally. Or I could say, make a G on your paper and you would have to write that letter. So that is um, that automaticity has to come verbally and in writing. Also, when you look at those um, three indicators, I mean, three verbs, identify, name and form. Identify could be I've dumped a lot of different tiles out on that table and I could ask you to find the letter B and you might pick the um, several letter B's out. Or I could give you three letters and say, find the letter H. I've narrowed it down for you. That identify is an easier skill than name. Name means I've shown you one, you tell me what it is. And then taking that verb to the next part, form, to form it, that's even more because now I'm having to think about that letter and actually um, write that letter um, down on paper or in a sandbox or um, in shaving cream. When we are teaching identified name and form, upper and lowercase letters, it is important that students are taught explicitly and really deciding on what handwriting you guys are gonna do at your own school or at the district. Stay away from the, um, the cute fonts. I remember being in first grade and that was when all the bubble lettering was coming around and kids would turn in their papers and they had spent um, so long writing as the simple sentence, I see a B because everything was in bubble letters because that's what they saw in my classroom. What we want them to do is form them correctly. Um, either Xander Blozer or Danilian, but that we are just writing and not doing the cute fonts. Our South Carolina Foundation um, support document specifically refers to using lessons from the University of Florida Literacy Institute, what we now commonly call UFLA. Um, that um, was the, the creators to that, Holly Lang and um, Valentina Contis. Um, they have been very explicit and systematic in their program. All of their um, resources are free to download on the website. However, you can order a manual to go with that for um, a minimum cost. But in there, there are a, um, lessons that are very explicit and they start with the handwriting and they start with the letters that go through. And this one that you see on the screen, of course, is letter G. Taking that and looking at what does it look like when I actually download one of the lessons, this teacher is um, working with the lesson on capital letter D. And on that lesson, it gives you that handwriting paper with the top line, the baseline, and the dotted line across the top. And I would say, today we're gonna make a new letter. Today we're gonna make the letter D. Everybody say that with me, D. Watch me as I make a capital D. I start at the top line and I come down to the baseline. I go back up and my pencil point touches the top of that, um, that line and I curve it around until I touch the bottom point of that line. I'd show that several different times and then I would say, you make a capital D. 
you might even as students are doing it, um, repeat the strokes of what they're supposed to do. Have them repeat the, um, repeat the steps of, of making that letter. Start at the top line. Like I said, with UFLY, there's actually a video um, that shows the progression of making a D all the way across. This is not a race. It's not to see who can make as many D's on that paper as they can, but who is forming that letter um, correctly. That's the goal. So you might need to um, talk with your principal, your secretary, about um, pulling out some and ordering some handwriting paper because we've let that go. Um, in past years, but now it is critical that we bring that back out. There's also some studies about how um, that organization, that handwriting and the brain, how it organizes us to think and so that it's not all over the page. I do wholeheartedly believe that I need to use this for handwriting, but that when it comes to composition, I do, I might want to go back and pull out um, blank paper, give the students space to write. But for forming those letters with this indicator, I do need the handwriting paper. On the screen, you see some of the paper that Audrey has used in the past, where it has the worm on the on the bottom line, the grass on the baseline, I think it's an airplane and maybe a sunshine thinking about um, the higher that we go. I typically just use that um, blue and red paper. I do hope that they have um, worked a little bit on the consistency of the paper because usually um, when you would have to erase, you'd erase a hole in that paper. And so, um, but that paper, like I said, is critical. Um, don't forget your left-handed students. When we were putting this together, we have um, numerous friends um, with us who are left-handed, and we've talked about holding that pencil um, correctly. But typically, if you're a right-handed teacher, you're going to show them that right-handed way. But you will probably need to sit with a little left-hander and show them how to hold the paper, how to um hold the pencil. You might even buy spiral notebooks that are go across the top with the spiral instead of um, down the side way, and that would be a great accommodation for them. This video, we absolutely love it. Um, sometimes students can teach um, each other a whole lot better than what we can, and so I know in the past you've had um, students who grip a pencil like this, like they're going to stab, or have it in between their fingers in a crazy hold. And so our friend here on the video is gonna show us exactly how to hold a pencil. Oh, Mandy, we're not able to hear the sound. When they grow up, it's going to be hard to write. So I'm going to show you the easiest way to hold it. It's called the tripod method. You have your thumb and your pointer finger pinching the pencil, and you want your middle finger resting underneath. You want your other two fingers tucked inside, and you want to hold it near the tip. But the big problem for most kids is to learning how to hold it. So I'm going to have a friend help us learn. Allie, are you there? Don't be shy, Allie. Hi, I'm Allie. I'm gonna show you the easy way to hold your pencil. Like she said, she's gonna show us the easy way to hold your pencil. Let's get to it, yay! Okay, Allie, show us how to hold the pencil, so. Oh, so what you wanna do is you want me to jump on the pencil and you want him to pick it up. know how to do that, what you want to do is have me pick up and then flip it. So you want Allie's jaws to pick up the pencil at the tip and then flip it like that. And then once you've done that, you have the correct position. And you want to keep practicing that. 
But once you've picked it up and flipped it, check if you're holding it right. Your thumb and your pointer finger will be pinching the pencil on top, middle finger will be resting it, and your other two fingers will be tucked inside, and you want to hold it at the tip. And you want to check that Allie's jaws look good. And you don't want it like this because you can't, Allie can't see. You don't want it like this because Allie's jaws are not in the right position. So you don't want to do either of those because Allie won't look good. You want Allie to look good. So that's what you want to look for. Now that you know how to hold a pencil, Allie, do you have any thoughts? <coughs> Allie, can you please tell us if that was a good way? <coughs> I'm trying to say I can't hold a pencil and talk at the same time. Oh. But do you think that was a good way to hold your pencil? Yeah, I think it was a good way. If you like this video, hit the like button. It's a fun if you haven't already. I'm Kiss Blair, and I'm Mel, and I'll see you next time. So with that, another just easy little thing is tip, like grab the tip, flip, and then grip. So you've got um, tip, flip, grip as a way to um, do that pencil as well. So that was on formation of the letters. This one is actually uh, identifying and even naming. This is using an alphabet arc. And with that alphabet arc, um, you will see it in um, reference to a lot of different places. We've seen it on um, Patton. We've seen it in Reading Rockets. On the screen, you see that it's lessened with the Florida Center of Reading Research, which is one of um, the map resources. The arc is like taking a cookie sheet um, with our magnetic letters and putting them, forming them around. That way there is no return sweep on that and the students see those alphabet letters um, linear like we do with the number line. And so as you're watching this video, you might want to um, send in um, the chat just like you did with the little um, boy and Allie. You might put in, in some ways that you um, use this instructional activity to support this indicator. Great job. A lot of visual in that. So I've been seeing Brianna has been dropping the links that we have in the chat. Don't worry if you don't get all those links. When you get your slide deck, you're going to have all of those resources that are here right underneath um, in the notes section for all of that. So that'll be able to, you can keep that all in one place and go back and look and actually um spend some quality time looking at some of these resources and all there is one where it is the template and it actually does all the alphabet from a to z which is um using that gradual lease needing a lot of support then we've seen one that just has a on on the alphabet arc and z and you fill in the rest which of course would be not nearly as much support needed um, on our next slide, we have um, given you that term to actually put um, some ideas in on there. We're not going to spend a lot of time um, on these page, this part at all. That's for your notes. You might think, I, 
want to go and say, I want to go back and um, download a template of an alphabet arc, or I, I, I want to make a class set of those, or we need more alpha, um, magnetic letters, whatever it is that you, that's your notes. That's where you get um, to uh, make another to-do list. So looking at standard um, 3.2, let's deconstruct that one. Our verbs are compare and contrast. And of course, we're not going to teach those together. We need to teach um, the, the basics of all of the letters first. Students have to have that repertoire of some letters, of course, um, in order to contrast. So we need to give them experience learning those letters and letter sounds. What are we going to um, compare and contrast? Letters. Now, on this one, you notice that we've done, um, in the context, we've put a little um, dividing line in because what we're going to compare are the similarities and what we're going to contrast are the differences. And then this indicator is even more specific because it tells us that we need to do letter names, shapes, sounds, capital um, and lowercase, and then writing strokes. So that can look a lot of different ways. This indicator will take you multiple days um, to, to work on because there's so much that is embedded in here. But we wouldn't know that unless we unpacked it. When you are working on your lesson plans, I encourage you to unpack the, these standards just like that. Today, I'm going to compare letters by upper and lower case. You've still done everything that, that it has said for you to do, but if you just write that indicator down in your lesson plan or you put it on the board, then there is no way that you can cover all of that in one lesson. So really stop and really um, focus on what it is that you're doing. So um, I could sort by vowels and consonants. I could sort by letters that have the um, sound in them like B, I can hear the B when I say that D, P, P T, E. I'm hearing the, the real of the sound at the onset of that. I also um, could sort them with letters that I hear. And this is a, a hard skill and one that you will have to study on too. But like in the word F, I hear the E sound before I hear the F. F, L, I hear E sound before I hear the letter sound. Like I said, that is hard, but that is a sort. I could sort letters with hard and soft sounds. Like I could pick out all the C's and all the G's. Think about that consonant sound wall that Audrey told us about um, last session. I could say, let's find all of the continuous sounds if my letters were right there on the table. And I would pull out like the S's, the M's, the N's with those continuous sounds. Or I could say, let's find the stop, all the letters that make the stop sound. That might be the P, the T, the D, or the C. One day I might sort by shape. I could say, let's find all the letters that hang down below the line. And I would be finding the Y, the J, the G. Or I could say, let's find all of the letters that touch that top um, line on our writing paper. I'd find L, H, D, B. Or another sort could be, write, um, let's find all the letters that have a circle, which would be the A, the B, the D, the P, the Q. Or ones with straight lines letters with diagonal lines. So there are a lot of different sorts if we stop and really think about what those are. Again, your curriculum is going to help you with, um, with these as you're going through. So for students to notice similarities and differences in those letter names, shapes, and strokes, we've got to know that ourselves, and we've got to be explicit in our teaching, especially highlighting those differences. This video that we're um, going to watch is one that um, 
they are putting the letters in what is called families. Great video, but don't think these are the only ways to put letters in families. If you have, um, go back to your curriculums when you get back, or if you have a handwriting curriculum, they're probably going to show you the letter families, just like this. To me, the Y, I don't make my Y with the, that hook on the end. I make it with the diagonal. So I would put that Y in the diagonal family. And you'll see that as you're watching um, this video together. Again, as you're watching it, think about how this might align with your instruction. In this video, we're going to look at how to go about explicitly teaching letter formations to children because we know that learners will not automatically pick up the correct letter formations just because they're exposed to the written text. We need to be deliberate and explicit in teaching letter formations. And now remember that letter formations leads to automatic writing, which then frees up the brain for more creative and critical thinking, which we know is one of the major goals of learning handwriting. Now let's look at how you could introduce the different letters. Do you start with A and work your way up to Z in the alphabet? Or you could choose a more explicit and constructive way, like using letter families, where you group letters together based on similarities to help learners remember the formation of letters. Now there are different handwriting programs out there and your school might follow a specific one. But the key concept behind most of them is to introduce learners to letters in groups or families. What you see on your screen now is an example of different letter families. And handwriting programs might group different letters together, and they can also give different names to these groups. Some common groups are the C-shaped letters with a rounded pattern. Now, these letters all start the same with a C-shape. The next is your linear shapes. And these letters are all grouped together because they all begin with a line. The next is the down, up and over letters. And these letters all begin with dropping down and then bouncing over. The next group is the diagonal shape letters. And these letters are grouped together because the first movement in writing these letters is a diagonal line. And the last group is a miscellaneous group. And these letters have no shapes or common strokes with each other or other letters. The benefits for teaching letters in groups with common strokes or a directional pull of the pencil is because it builds motor memory and promotes rhythmic or fluent writing. The repetition of the shared movement helps with learning letter formation. Now, motor memory refers to the ability to instantly recall and complete a specific motor movement. So without you having to think about it. When you do something so many times that it becomes automatic, that is motor memory. We use motor memory all the time. For instance, tying our shoelaces. It was once a very complicated task that we needed to think about and concentrate while doing. But the more we practiced, the less we had to think about it until it was automatic and you did not have to think about it at all. In fact, the brain was free to think about other things and to even hold a conversation with someone else while tying our shoelaces. Now, writing is the same. When you master handwriting, you can write without having to stop and think about where to start or stop the letter. It has become automated through the years of practice, which allows us to become fluent and automatic writers. Often learners with a messy handwriting have not yet developed this motor memory. All right, I want you to um, practice for me. I want you to think back to that sentence that um, was on that class scenario when we got started. It was, I see a big tree. Please say that sentence after me. I see a big tree. Let's count how many words are in that sentence. I see a big tree. I want you to write that sentence on your paper. <clears throat> you 
you're probably writing it um, very fluently. You're probably writing it automatically. You probably knew which letters to capitalize, which ones to hang below the line with the big, with the G. You knew the, uh, the correct spacing. You knew the strokes to use on that. Just think how much um, brain power you just used by writing that sentence. Now imagine being five. And even though that sentence, or six, even though that sentence is very um, simple, that takes a lot of our cognitive um, memory and thought. So if we have taught how to actually make and form those letters, then it makes writing that part so much easy. I think about um, being back in my classroom and I could have said to the students, um, Today, we're going to write a story about a tree. Remember yesterday when we were out on the playground and we um, saw that big maple tree? I want you to write a, about a time that you played or you climbed a tree. Well, automatically, first, and, um, first graders are going to, some of them are going to jump off and ready to write. And some are still sitting there thinking, what am I supposed to write? I'm supposed to write about a tree. How do you spell the word tree? I want to write, I see a big tree, but I don't know how, how to do that. Um, we are lift, taking some of that lift off them when we show them and talk to them about how to form letters. In the past, we would have had, in that scenario I just told, I would have had students from the get-go saying, how do you write tree? How do you make a G? And so as we're working through our phonics um, standards and indicators today, I want you to see how we're putting that teaching part into this so that they are building that foundation to write those words so that when we get into um, more composition in second and third and on up, they're able to focus on content and not just the formation of those letters. So when noticing similarities and differences in letters, there's a lot of things that we can use for practice. We can use read alouds that specifically highlight a letter, like in this book, D is for dress up. This gives the students an opportunity to practice maybe with a targeted letter. And we're not talking about letter of the week. We're just talking about teaching those letters specifically and systematically. Um, they hear me say um, the sound of that. They see how that um, letter is formed. I might, we might write it in the air. I might write it on the board, ask them to write it on their whiteboards. Those alphabet books are very helpful because I can um, see the letter. I can see it in upper and lower case. I can hear the sound, but then I've got a um, several words that go um, with that letter. Just be cautious about maybe the pictures because now we're understanding how um, those pictures um, are very um, important. That my E might not be with the elephant because I hear that L with um, sound first with that elephant. Practice with sound trays, writing letters, um, using letters from the, the that letter family like we just saw in um, the video. We can use blocks to build letters. And then that sample um, or those um, little blocks right there are actually um, block pieces. And so they um, come together just like puzzle pieces and that you can use them to um, form and make those letters and um, we have the link for that there for you and then lastly of course magnetic letters are a great um, source and resource to use with the, this particular indicator so indicator 3.3 take a moment to read that one So our verb is produce. Our concept is one-to-one -one consonant letter sounds, consonant. And our context is with automaticity. Again, that automaticity applies orally and in writing. 
And when you look back up at that main standard at the top in the darker lavender, always it is decode, which is reading it, and encode, which is writing it. It's important to remember that if our students in um, first and second don't have those sounds, that we go back and we work with those as well with them. So in teaching letter sounds, this can be fun and, and, and active. It does not have just to be um, sitting on the carpet, seeing a D and doing the D sound. There are so many activities that um, that benefit and you will see a lot of those in your curriculums and then you probably you know several that you um in your um, teaching bag that you can pull up one of those is singing the alphabet song and not just typically the typical alphabet song but in this video we're going to see where they you he uses um the twinkle twinkle um little star in order to do the alphabet and so we're seeing it in different ways this teacher is reviewing the alphabet. It is from Reading Rockets, um, from that resource, Reading Rockets. He, um, letter names are um, done, letter sounds. All of that, again, is through song play. But keep in mind that this is not explicit teaching. This is practice. This is review. He has already done the, um, the explicit teaching in another area. We love this video. Audrey and I love this video for several reasons. One, it's a male teacher in um, primary grades. He has visual alphabet cards. He's using gradual release. You hear him um, singing and then he pulls his voice out. We see students with their eyes on text. They're not just looking up at the ceiling, but they're actually focused in on the text. And in this um, case, the cards are the text. Um, Again, you will um, see that this is not a, a perfect video. And as a coach, there are places that we could go in and help him to see other um, other things, just like what you see right there in that um, box, um, purple box. He is doing the C with cactus, which is a hard C sound, but we, he might want to put in a soft um, C sound like in circus to do next time and not just focus on that hard. So we're going to go ahead and play this so that you can um, enjoy it as much as we do. I love the ABCs. I love the ABCs so much. I love to put them in my mouth. <laughs> I do. Who knows the alphabets in my mouth song? You do? I got the whole alphabets in my mouth. I got the whole alphabet in my mouth. I got the whole alphabet in my mouth, and I'm learning to read. I got the A alphabet in my mouth. I got the B alphabet in my mouth. I got the C in my mouth, and I'm learning to read. Good job. Good job. All right. That video makes me happy. And it, that is the ultimate goal. That is when we're teaching letters. That is when we're teaching sounds in order to be able to read words. I do have to say a while ago, I did say twinkle, twinkle, little star. And I now know that um, I did a, a mess up right there and that it was the whole world in his hands to the tune to that. Again, just be very cognizant of the, the cards or the pictures that you um, put with that, because if we're doing a C sound, we sure don't want a cheetah, which um, would not be the correct C 
sound or that with that that soft C. That's a whole different area um, to go into. So just be very aware of um, the examples that we're using. He could have even used um, the articulation cards, the mouth gesture cards, um, because those which Audrey showed us last week also have that picture on it. And it brings that focus to getting our um, mouth in the right position with our teeth and tongue and, and all um, to do those sounds. I love the ABC. All right, so now we're gonna see uh, quick example of how a teacher in Chester County um, in South Carolina is teaching letter sounds and embedding a sound wall as a resource for her students. So we wanted to pull back what we talked about last time around sound walls and to see how now we're connecting the letter symbols through it. Make sure you're noticing how she utilizes the terms that indicate all of the articulatory features and the connections to the sounds and the letters. And then also just pay attention to the engagement of their students, their understanding and their excitement about learning, especially the little friend in the front uh, in red. I see that I just want to um, um, respond to people sometimes when they think, oh, drill and kill. And it's not drill and kill when we're teaching phonics. We are, it's like um, just practicing to create perfection and excitement. There is joy in that classroom around learning to read. Um, here on this right. next slide, we see a a close-up of a teacher who is showing the kid lip cards during instruction again of the sound of and then we see the sound wall with a keyword picture of the fish and the spellings that have already been taught f f f p h and then a student is adding words to the sound wall that represents that sound of so when you're in your classroom be thinking about how you can connect the sound walls and the articulation pictures of the, and then to the spellings of the sounds and sample words that could represent those sounds. So I was in a classroom once and the teacher said, show me the three ways we know um, how to spell the sound and so kids are writing, but then I see them keep turning around and looking towards me and I'm at the back of the room. I'm like, why are they looking at me? What's going on? And then I realize, oh, I'm standing right next to their sound wall. And sure enough, on the sound wall was the where the letter S goes and then all or the sound is located, but then all the ways that they had learned how to spell the sound with S ss and a c and so they were using it as a resource if we're going to use a sound wall we want to make sure that it is being used in a way that is beneficial to students audrey and i put together um this presentation and we've told you that we've done it on out on the road um in several different locations and then we have narrowed it down for a virtual field 
The next slide shows you two different videos that we found and we pulled together. There are so many resources once you get started. Our trouble was narrowing it down in the amount of time. When you get your slide deck, go back and watch these two. I'm going to give you just a little um, meaning of what they are. The first one is the girl, um, the teacher, uh, and she is using her program to teach the letter and the sound for P. And in the second one, it is a dad sitting at the kitchen counter working with a um, alphabet arc where the teacher has just sent home that paper copy and the little paper tiles, and they're able to use that alphabet art this time with letters and sounds. He might say, find the letter that makes the mm sound, and the child picks it up and it puts it on there. So both of these are great videos, but for time's sake, we are going to go on to 3.4. So this one again is for kindergartners. And when we look at the um, verbs in this, we need to identify the vowel and produce the vowel sound. 3.3 was all about consonants. 3.4 is all about vowels. In the context, you see that it says a printed syllable or word or when decoding closed, open, and VCE with prompting and support. So a printed syllable um, a lot of times is a nonsense word, especially if you're using those blending boards, you might get VEP. I can sound that out, but I also know that that is a nonsense word. Sometimes those nonsense words are all um, as a printed syllable could be like in dis, D-I-S. That's a printed syllable, but if I put dis with like, then I have the word dislike. And so we're showing, we're calling those printed syllables because as students start um, reading multisyllabic, they're not just nonsense words, they are part of the word. They're those syllable pieces. And so that closed, open, and VCE, if you're a kindergarten teacher and you're thinking, what is that? I promise we're going to um, go over what that means. Let's take a look at first grade. First grade, we need to identify the vowel, produce the vowel sound, and we're going to do that in a printed syllable and in word. Now we ran out of boxes on this because that indicator, and you see it at the top of that screen, is so packed. So let's just look at that one with the, um, the yellow or reddish color um, arrow. Let's take a look at it. When we look at it, we need to decode and encode one syllable words with closed, open, and VCE by the end of the year in first grade. Now that indicator is the only one that says decode and encode. And that means I can read it and I can write those um, correctly because I now have had all my kindergarten year to work on um, those um, VC, um, CVC words or on those open syllables, which might be like the word two or B. I've had all that time to do it, and now I'm also, um, by the end of um, first grade, I should do, be able to do some of those magic E words. In B, I need to decode um, I need to code one syllable words with vowel R. Notice we say vowel R because that helps students remember that the vowel comes before the R like in car. If um, we stay with what we've said before, like with bossy R, students sometimes think that the R is the boss and has to come first. But if we call it vowel R, that puts the concentration back on the vowel. Taking a look and looking at even that C, because this one is broken down even more, first graders decode two syllable words using their knowledge and syllable types with guidance and support. 
those syllable types are you can see them on your screen closed open vce vowel r vowel teams and then the consonant with le like in the word turtle those are your six syllable types if you've um, seen posters and charts with that the that by first grade we have taught now by the end of the year all six syllable types Notice there's another part of that indicator that says compound words, and then it says syllable types. That's like in the word cupcake. When I break that apart um, to read or to write, cup is a CVC word, and then cake, of course, is a vowel um, consonant E um, word, and then I can put it together, cupcake. So I've taught um, students um, the CVC in kindergarten first. We've worked on the VCE. And I can show you how to do that with some compound words. And um, they love that. They think that they are writing ginormous words. And it's actually they're able to do it because we've broken it up and we've been very direct um, with them. So looking at second grade, this 3.4, we are going to identify the vowel in printed syllable and in word and then when you look across in the pink box we're going to decode multisyllabic we're going to use those same six syllable types but this time we're adding the schwa in there and if you need extra um, with schwa go back to session two and watch audrey's video with the vowel valley where the schwa goes up at the top and we knew that it was um, of the vowel being very lazy, like in the word banana. Also in second grade, they have to apply. They have to apply the understanding of multisyllabic word construction and the um, syllable division principles to do decode grade appropriate multisyllabic words. Now, if you think that's a mouthful, it is. Um, it is. Um, very much so. This right here, this indicator, you could spend many sessions and should spend many sessions learning more about these um, principles and this construction. But Audrey's going to kick it off with us with a little bit of guidance and where to go next with that. All right, and um, I want to, before we move into that, I just want to bring back something uh, someone had asked in the chat around the, um, should students be read or writing, decoding, and encoding the same types of words in the, in the same path? And we could see here in this standard that that is not the case because some of the indicators show decode and encode, and then we have some that just say decode. And so our standards are set up so that what is appropriate for decoding is included and what is expected for encoding is included at later times. And so, um, yes, they, they're actually not on the same pathway because writing does, uh, that is a production uh, activity and it is uh, a lot more challenging. So in your notes, you're going to find a um, chart where you can take notes around the six syllable types because our standards specifically name them. We wanted to be sure that we discuss them. So the first syllable type is a closed syllable. Um, this is when there is one vowel and it is closed in by a consonant. And so like the word cat is an example of that. When that happens, that vowel sound is typically a short vowel sound. I'm going to say typically because is, there are exceptions to it, but majority of the cases, it is a short vowel sound. So if we can teach that to kids, they know what sound to utilize in most cases. Then the next um, syllable type is an open syllable. That is when there is a vowel sound or a vowel at the end of a syllable. Um, and when that happens, typically the vowel sound is long. So like in the word go, but it could be in a multisyllabic word like tiger, the first syllable tie, that is an open syllable. And that's why the I says I or has an I sound. The third type is a vowel consonant E syllable. Um, that is when we have one 
vowel, one consonant, and then the E at the end that is silent, um, like in the word cake. And sometimes this has been called in schools magic E, bossy E. And um, what I would suggest is as a school, you determine what are you going to call that syllable, whether it's a VCE syllable, magic E, bossy E, whatever you choose. But choose as a school because students that are struggling are going to um, have better uh, control of that if they're hearing consistency across the years from K one and two. If they go to intervention, how does it sound? And imagine their confusion if in one classroom they're hearing magic E, but then they go to another classroom for intervention and they hear bossy E, and now they're saying, well, is it the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing? Are we not? So uh, we wanna make sure we're using consistency there. Next, we see vowel teams and vowel teams typically People have just thought, oh, it's when two vowels go walking, the first one does the talking. That is what I did as a teacher. What I wasn't thinking about was that a vowel team is actually two, three, or even four letters that work together to make a vowel sound. And the two vowels go walking jingle actually only is happening um, with consistency 50% of the time. If we teach that and it's only going to be accurate 50% of the time, that's going to cause a lot of confusion for our students. So if we just teach them a vowel team is two, three, or four letters working together, like in boat, O-A, but also like in night, I-G-H, are working together. Next um, syllable type is a vowel R, and Kim talked about the importance of utilizing that language. We see um, it is in our standards as vowel R. It's going to help kids remain focused on it's a vowel and an R and how that changes the sound of the vowel. And then finally, the last syllable type is a consonant LE. That's when we have a consonant followed by LE. The, only, the cool thing about this syllable type is that it always has to be connected to another syllable. So you're always going to have a two syllable word, at least with this syllable type. Um, like in the word turtle, we have a vowel R syllable, tur, and then consonant LE. So that was a quick rundown of the six syllable types. I want you to be thinking about your school's curriculum. Maybe you've been peeking at it for this upcoming year and think, is six syllable type instruction included in that? If not, you can pull it into the, into the instruction as needed because it is part of our standards. We also want to let you know that there is a great resource through uh, Reading Rockets that um, an article from Louisa Motes and Carol Tolman, the author of letters that talks about the silic syllable types. Also, when you get into letters, um, um, your training through letters, it is in unit two's session, uh, I'm sorry, unit three, session two. We are also including in um, the resources, it's on your landing page, a link to a um, slideshow that has a ton of other uh, just information for you. So this will help build up your understanding of the six syllable types if this is something that um, you uh, need to just gain additional knowledge on. I do want to just point out that the, in this resource, they use the word R controlled, um, but again, our standards utilize Val R, so we just suggest that you uh, utilize that with your students. All right, so once syllable types are, are taught, then students can be taught how to decode multisyllabic words. One of my favorite strategies to teach is to teach the spot, dot, and divide um, strategy for breaking apart um, multisyllabic words. But in order to do this, they also have to know those syllable division principles that were taught or discussed in um, the indicators for 3.4. So in the purple box and in your notes, there is a place for you to record this. You can see that the first syllable division principle is V, C, C, V. That means that it is a word where there's a vowel, a consonant, 
another consonant, and then a vowel. And this is the most type of uh, most common type of syllable. And we can teach kids that when we see that pattern in a word, boom, we can divide it between the two consonants. And then we end up with two different syllables that we can read. The next most common is if there's one vowel, one consonant, and then another vowel. And typically, the first thing we want to do is if we divide the word after that first vowel, we end up with an open syllable and then another syllable type after it. So we want to teach kids how to do that. That's why closed syllables and then open syllables are part of K and 1 early on. Now, if that ends up not working for kids, it doesn't have a correct sound, the word doesn't make sense, then we can teach them, oh, well, let's just try after that um, consonant. And now we have a closed syllable at the beginning and then another syllable type. That's the third most common type of uh, syllable division principle to use. And then finally, the last one is when we have two vowels. And here's that opportunity where two vowels are not going walking. Those two vowels are breaking apart and they are going to be their own syllables. So now we're going to go through the process of spot, dot, and divide using these syllable division principles. There's a place for you on your note catcher to record the example and then you're going to practice. All right, so let's look at our first word. Here's our first word. Say I don't know what it says. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spot the vowels and I'm going to dot them. Yes, there we go. And then I'm looking between those two dots and I'm noticing, oh, there are two consonants. So if I go to my syllable division principles, I see that's the first one. I'm going to divide it right between those two consonants. And so I have cac, tus, cactus. There we go. So now here is your choice. Now, I would not write these letters below it for students. I only put that on the slide so that you would see which syllable division principle. I think it becomes too cumbersome if we're adding all those additional letters for students. So here's your example. So think about what we have to do. We have to spot the vowels. So did you spot them? We dot them. We look between, we see two Bs, two consonants. We need to break it right there. And so we now have rabbit. Rabbit. Yes, but when we say it, rabbit. All right, here's our next word. Again, if I was going to spot the vowels, I spot them, I dot them. But now when I look between, I only see one consonant. So can I use my first syllable division principle? No way. I got to go to the second one. And I'm going to divide it right after the, that first vowel. And now what I have is an open syllable. So I know that vowel is going to be a long vowel sound. Ro. And then my second syllable is a closed syllable. Bot. Ro. Bot. So now you try with this word. So you're going to record it on your chart. Spot the vowels, dot the vowels, and think about which syllable division principle. Hopefully you're picking two, and you're going to now have an open syllable, which ends up just being one letter, O, and then a closed syllable, pen, open. Good. So now we've gone through the first two syllable division principles. We're ready for our next one. Okay. So our next one, we see a word up here. Again, I'm going to spot the vowels. I'm going to dot them. And I'm noticing, hey, there's an E at the end. And we've learned about the vowel, uh, uh, VCE uh, syllable type. And I know that that E always stays in the same syllable as the vowel before it. So I'm just going to star that. And then I'm going to think about what do I see between? Oh, just one consonant. If I divided it after the first vowel, it would say phyxate. That does not make sense. What is that word? So what I'm going to do is now teach kids how when that happens, if it's not sounding right, now I need to divide it using the third syllable division which is right after that consonant. And now I have a closed syllable, fix, and then 
that val uh, VCE syllable eight, fixate. You know, fixate on these syllable types. All right, here's your chance. Try it with this one. Spot the vowels. Dot the vowels. Did you notice the E? It's going to stay with the syllable before. And then you're going to think about where I could divide it. Now you may be thinking, hey, there are two consonants there. Do I break those apart? But we have taught through our standards that we know that CK comes after a short vowel. It's never going to come at the beginning of a syllable or a word. So I know I'm already going to use my third syllable division principle. And so now we can break it here. Pack edge. Oh, pack edge. I thought it was pack age. Here's another opportunity for you to teach kids the schwa sound, which we saw come up in the second grade, where, hey, it has the VCE um, syllable type, but it's getting lazy here, and so now it has a different sound. All right, last but not least, our last syllable division principle. I have, I spot the vowels, I dot the vowels. I'm thinking, oh, that's a vowel team. I'm going to say flunt, mm, but that doesn't make sense as a word. So I'm going to try out that last syllable division principle. And I have an open syllable, flu, and a closed syllable, ent, fluent. That's what we want for students, them to become fluent with this. Here's your chance with this last word. Good. And what kind of syllable type do you have in that second syllable type? We have lie, which is an open syllable. What kind of syllable is at the end? If you're thinking it's closed, it is, but it has a schwa sound. Now, if you are thinking, oh my goodness, Audrey, this is slowing down reading, guess what? It is, it's gonna slow down reading. But once kids start to pick up this practice of marking up words, what happens is it becomes automatic for them so that at some point I can say to kids, you don't have to mark it up if you don't want to because I see their little wheels turning and then what's happening is they are starting to do it automatically in their brain. They can divide it and then it just becomes one of their sight words that have now been stored in their visual word form area. So um, it is going to slow down reading at first so that it can become automatic. All right, great resources here for you. If you have um, access to this book, the syllable division book, um, it has list of words by syllable division um, principle and type. Um, and then you can be thinking of all the different types of words that you can um, have students practice um, decoding to become more fluent as a reader. So what Audrey just showed us was in isolation where we were going in and looking at the, those syllables. We were doing some word analysis um, with that, that, but we never just do that in pure isolation. That's where our decodable texts come in and are um, very necessary during all of this because what we're doing is then putting into practice what we have been learning. She told you all six of the syllable types all and those four um, division rules all within a 10 minute time. Of course, this is going to take you a year um, and in some cases, two, three years to do it, but never um, leave out these decodable texts. We've also heard that a lot of schools are just buying decodable texts because that's the buzzword. And we don't just use decodables because that's the thing to do now. We always put the skill with the text. And so um, really great reading has some great passages. And you can see in this one that it's showing you up at the top exactly the skill it is that was used. And I think this one was multisyllabic words. And then, of course, there are going to be some decodables, um, most likely with um, the curriculum that you pick.
if you don't have access to all of that and you or you do and you want something else the book shifting the balance where we um picked out our um, goals at the beginning of this if you go to their website the six shifts Dot com, which is again in the notes of the slide, you will see that you can download different lists. They have the short vowels and long vowels. They give you word list and they also give you practice sentences or passages um, with that. And so this is um, showing you an example of that. So standard 3.5, we are going to blend letter sounds and we are going to decode vowel consonant and um vowel consonant vowel um, i think i said that wrong we're going to do um vc and cvc words in the context of isolation and in text and when we talk about isolation we don't mean a list of 50 words we're talking about the words that you have just done with your lesson could be the words that you've done over the course of the um, week or two weeks probably five no more than 10 words that you would give them this can be done with a blending board it can be done making letters to make words it could be words that you've done on the whiteboard or it could be a simple list of words that um students would read but it is in isolation and that's to see if they actually know those syllable patterns and how to decode those words so on this um, next slide is a blending board from ufly it's um it is a electronic blending board where you would just type in the letters and um, it puts the consonant, the vowel, the consonant up, push them together. The word is cat. Again, underneath there, there is the text that now after I have read these words in isolation, now I'm going to put them back in a text so that I can practice with that. And you can see this text definitely is on VC, um, CVC words. UFLY also has a way that you can download um, specific uh, words from each of the vowel types this is the short vowel list and it is focusing just on short a and so you can see where it pulls up what it looks like little flashcards. this can be done on the board or they could be printed off there also is um, we have found out a phonics word list generator and you can find that at phonicswordlist.com and then you as you're generating your list you check the boxes of which are the vowel types you want do you want to include real words nonsense words or both so you're able um, to do that we have um heard from different teachers that sometimes they just put up maybe 10 to 15 words like at the morning meeting and they read that list and they move on to um the next part of of the day but they have a routine in there or sometimes if you have extra time you can go back and review lists so um we we think that is um a great use of time with that you can do that with um reading with a partner you could um they could um use those cards back and forth and, and play a game um at a station time too so 3.6 when we look at 3.6, we see that it is in kindergarten, first and second grade. When we look at um, the verbs, they're all the same, all the way down through there. It is delete, add, or substitute for kindergarten, first and second. What are we going to delete, add, and substitute? Well, it's going to be the initial, medial, and end, end sounds with that that doesn't change what does change is the context in kindergarten it's going to be cvc words that they're going to build and then make new words on uh, the word is rat say the word rat let's tap the word rat let's write the word rat or make the word out of our magnetic letters 
for first grade right now it just says words um build and make but those words that they're going to build are going to be based on the syllable type that you have just taught. And remember, in first grade, we teach all six of the syllable types. We're not just going to pull random words out to do this with. It's going to match up with the skill that we've been teaching. In second grade, it could be any of those syllable types again, including um, that schwa. And it's also going to be some multisyllabic words. And I gave you that in um, in the in the compound words like in cupcake, but it also could be in uh, multisyllabic words like dislike or important, where we're pu pulling all of that together. So again, um, for this, I, I think we have time um, to watch this video because we're um, winding down to the end. So let's go ahead and watch this teacher being very explicit in building and making the words with a CVC. The final step in teaching students the alphabetic principle is connecting awareness of how words are segmented into sounds with knowledge of different letter sound relationships. We're going to spell some words that are made up of sounds that we've already learned, and you're going to use your sound box and your letters to do that. So when we're working, first we're going to say the word, then we're going to stretch the word holding up one finger for each sound, then we're going to move the letters into the sound boxes for each sound. We'll touch each letter, and then we'll read the word. Some of the words will only have three sounds, so we'll just leave the last one blank. Okay. So watch my example and listen. The first word I'm going to do is dug. The excavator dug a hole at the construction site. So first I'm going to say it, dug. Then I'm going to do it with my fingers, dug. Then I'm going to move it. You just watch, dug. I'll touch the letters as I make the sounds, dug. And then when I read the whole word, I'll do my finger under it, dug. Okay. You can just still just watch. Now I'm going to change one letter to change dug to dig. So look at my letters here. Raise your hand if you can tell me what letter do you think I should change to make dug turn into dig? Grace? Change the U into an I. Okay, so I'm going to take the U away and put the I in the middle. So let's all say dig. Dig. That sound. Dig. Now say the sound as I touch it. Dig. And now let's say the whole word. Dig. Good. So now it's going to be your turn. Very good. So let's that you could tell that that was um, kindergarten into first grade. Um, with that, especially looking at the CVC part, we know that that is that closed syllable. When we look at second grade where it says multisyllabic, here are some ideas for that. We could um, say and write the word snowman. Now let's change snowman. The final step is snow, snowmen. Then we actually um, change that, um, that vowel sound in man. It could be that we're adding to, such as robot. Now make your word robotic. Again, multisyllabic. The word is flipper, right flipper. Now change that um, sound to make that word slipper. Again, multisyllabic word. We have been asked um, why in our phonemic awareness, and you see that just popped up, that um, phonemic awareness indicator 1.7, that it says, um, that in phonemic awareness, we are just going to do a um, beginning sound or first sound and last sound or final sound. But in our phonics, we are now including the vowel sound to that in first and second grade. When you're doing your Hegarty work and you're doing just the sound work 
it is hard enough for little people, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, to um, keep that word in their mind and change the beginning sound and ending sound when it is just auditory. But once you put the letters with it, that is easier to maneuver. And you could see that when this teacher did um, dig to duck. They had um, the manipulative to work with that. And so that is why the phonics piece um, brought in the vowel sound to that. But when it is just auditory, it is the initial and final. And that also was um, a part of what Dr. Barbara Foreman, who works or did with the Institute of Educational Sciences and, and was an educational consultant to our standards, she said when we have that use of manipulatives, it makes that, that medial sound much easier to see and to hear with that. And so that is why those manipulatives are super important, especially when we get to the phonics. So word chaining is um, a great tool to use with this because we are constantly adding, deleting, and substituting sounds. This is totally different than just um, putting a list of or a string of letters up on the board and saying how many words can you make with all of these letters. This is, again, you being very intentional with what you're asking students to do. And you can see that in that um, first column where the teacher language would be build the word, build the word mat. Now change the t to a p sound at the end. So you are guiding the students through those word chains. There are different resources that you can find on word chains. This one is a download from the six shifts and it uh, alleviates you being caught on the spot and um, say, might say a word that you shouldn't have said or you wish that you hadn't have said. And so um, it helps you go from um, word to word in doing that. It's very organized and, again, um, systematic. Another resource that you can do is dyslexiclogic.com. Um, there are multiple word lists. And both of these lists show like 20 different words in a list. Don't do that many. Um, probably five to seven is enough words to do in a chain for one day, but you could pick up the next day and do words eight to 20 or eight to 15 and then move on to another list. Both of these, um, the web um, resource is gonna be in your notes. And so we reached our goal today. Our goal was to unpack um, the phonics standards 3.1 to 3.6. So why are phonics and word analysis important? Um, often students have in the past been placed in interventions that have lasted from year to year to year. And it's all been focused on comprehension because that is the output that we see. Oh, their comprehension is lacking. And it, unfortunately, those interventions have yielded little results. And why is this? Um, because of the great words of Dr. Anita Archer that says there is no comprehension strategy powerful enough to compensate for the fact that you can't read the words. And so when you're thinking about students that are having difficulty with reading comprehension, our first question should be, how are they with decoding? Because if they can't decode, then no matter what we give them in terms of comprehension, they're really going to have difficulties. So love this quote from her and um, how it links specifically to the importance of systematic and explicit instruction. Uh, last time we talked about our love of the book Seven Mighty Moves. We love this because it's ease of reading and it's practical application. Also, it's connection to the content and letters. And so in standards um, F1 
and F3, we see four of the moves. So um, move one is about moving away from um, teaching phonemic awareness randomly to teaching it intentionally and explicitly through a scope and sequence. And then today we see moves two to three and four, which is moving away from teaching phonics incidentally. So in the past, I would teach based on the phonics skills that I see in a book that, oh, this is the book I'm going to read with my group. These are the skills I'm going to focus on, but really teaching it explicitly and systematically, moving from least complex to most complex skills, moving away from teaching three cueing strategies to deco teaching decoding strategies. We know that is in uh, the updated Read to Succeed law that we are to avoid using three cueing strategies. And then finally, moving away from using predictable text in the early grades to using decodable text for beginning readers. So all of those are listed in there. Um, we wanted to draw your attention to it and its connection to our standards. And then finally, um, we also know that if you've attended previous sessions, we've uh, you know that we've created documents that help to align our new standards to the components of these trainings and letters so that you can see the connections. Um, today, we saw theory and instructional practices that are expanded on in units one and three of letters. Again, you have access to these in all of the resources that we have. Um, we do this because we want you to see that letter training standards and new curriculum are not all separate in isolation. They are all working together to create this perfect trifecta of uh, teaching for our students. All right, a couple other resources we want to draw your attention back to. If you've been with us for session one and two, you've heard us reference the Foundations of Literacy support document. Um, in the Foundations of Literacy support document, you will find some support for standard three with decoding and voting encoding phonics and word analysis skills. Um, just a few extra resources are located within that Foundations of Literacy support document, some that were mentioned here today, especially looking at the vocabulary within this standard um, articulated with the definitions from our glossary. So really essential to study that. Um, additionally, if you have students who are struggling with phonics, um, particularly the phonics outlined in the Foundations of Literacy Standards, one great tool to kind of do an inventory and find out what specific standards and indicators they're struggling with would be using the indicator aligned inventory for word recognition. We've touched on this several times and, and um, in the fall, you'll see an updated video presentation on the indicator aligned inventory that just outlines how to use this tool to find out which phonics indicators your students are struggling with so that you can intervene in those areas to support your students with mastery of those skills. For more information for that, uh, check back with us um, with an updated video. All right, that brings us to our conclusion, and I want to stop for just a second. We find that the conclusion of our presentations often gets rushed, um, but we see the value in really thinking about um, what did we learn during our time together today and doing a little reflection. So if you will, I want you to do the red light reflection with me today. I want us to stop and think about is there anything presented today that highlights an area for you that you could stop doing as far as your phonics instruction? For me, if I take that step back and go three years ago when I was in the classroom, one thing I would stop doing is stop using predictable text with my students. Um, that was where my bend was and that was where all my resources were, right? But seeing the uh, evidence of using decodable text instead, that's a practice that I know I would stop. I would abandon immediately. Um, think about your practice and what you could continue doing. Um, if I go back three years ago to my classroom, one thing I would continue are those word chains. I knew that they were worthwhile because I saw how it gave my students the ability to isolate the sounds and words in order to decode better. Um, but I was doing it pretty haphazardly. And uh, just because I knew it was working, now I can see a way to do it systematically with Kim and Audrey's coaching. Um, and then something I might start doing, something I need to start doing is teaching the syllable types. 
That was something mm-hmm. I, it was totally new information to me when I went through letters training. And then when I sat and really listened to that training from Kim and Audrey, syllable types was brand new for me. And even every time I listened to that part of their presentation, I learned something new. So uh, for me, I may even have to rewatch the video a couple of times to really build my foundational knowledge of syllable types and syllable division practices. Um, I always get fixate wrong whenever she shows it. So <laughs> for me, that's when I, I still need to practice. All right. In the chat, I hope you're dropping some of your things you want to stop, things you want to continue because you're like, wow, that was something really effective or something you want to start doing. Hey, and school starts on July 22nd or whenever after that for you all, what do you want to start with? All right. That 